As you can see, our New Testament reading can be found in Acts 2, 1 through 21. If you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, it's on page 1004. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't have a lot to say about our call to worship. The psalmist in Psalm 104 is alerting us to something that's part of the tradition in the Hebrew tradition, part of the tradition there that the Adventists have embraced, we the Adventists have embraced. You see, we maintain that man was formed of dust, that that body that was formed was breathed into and became a living being. And in that tradition, the psalmist here says, when, when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. And when you send your spirit or your breath again, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. And then the psalmist says, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. There's something very poetic about the power that is being claimed for God here. Creative power, power over nature, power over life. When he withdraws breath, life is gone from us, and when he breathes on us, we are indeed energized. It is in this sense that Spirit has two holds, two meanings, two dimensions. Spirit, breath, we've talked about this many times before. Pneuma, pneumatic tires, pneumatic wrench, air-filled, breath. But that same word is also the word for the Holy One, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so we have this connection of living life and breath and God's life and presence and creative energy. When we get to the gospel reading, Jesus is speaking now of some sort of new creation in life. The gospel reading isn't referring back to our psalm, but the gospel reading points us to something different, something that's changed. You see, in the Jewish tradition, life has been lived out of promise and out of covenant. And it's not going to change that much as Jesus comes. It's going to be a different covenant and a new promise. But now he's speaking about the advocate that comes when he himself departs. 
We just went through ascension season. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father in glory, having ascended back to heaven from whence he came. That season is followed, as we've talked about, by Pentecost, ultimately. And Jesus is saying, look, it's necessary that I go away. I'm going to send someone to you, and he will be the spirit of truth, one who testifies of the Father and one who testifies about me. And he will testify, as you must, for you've been with me in the beginning. Now, he tells the disciples this. Look, I know your concern is about where I'm going and what all of that means, but I want you to focus on something else. It's good that I'm going because the advocate can now come to you. I will send him to you. And when he comes, verse 8, he will prove the world to be in wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. I have much more to say to you about this than you can bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into truth. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So, he will testify and prophesy, and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that the Father has is mine, and that is why the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. For I and my Father, we are one. Now, I don't want to be confusing about this. I simply want to say there seems to be in this thing we call Godhead, this oneness and this separateness, this unity, this social reality, and this distinctness. And Jesus is playing both. And he says, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you an advocate, a comforter, a spirit. And this spirit will testify concerning me and will lead you into all truth. It will prophesy. It will enliven you. It is whom you will live your life by as you take my name and make your way through the world. So what we see in just these two texts, if I can bring it to a a sort of point of meaning this early on, what we see in these two texts is that the Spirit is present and part of what's happening in the creation. That is to say, the Spirit gives us breath and life. The Spirit is our breath and life. Physical realities of living are dependent on the breath of God, the energy with which God gives us and creates us and enlivens us. And then when we look at what it means to be a follower of Christ or to live in a world post-ascension, where Christ's presence is no longer with us in the flesh, where he no longer walks among us, tells his parables, teaches, preaches, heals, and, 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 and works his, his wonders. In the flesh, we have the Spirit who speaks words from the Son, who gets them from the Father, and who leads us in all truth and through the Spirit enlivens us. So you have life given us in the bodily creation and form of existence, and life given us as we follow the one who created us into newness of life out of death and sin and into the fullness of life out of the abundance of God's grace and person. I hope that isn't confusing to you. I'm saying basically we have life lived in the body as created and life lived in the spirit as he sent to us post-ascension spiritual life and health and growth and reality. It's not a terribly complex thing, and it is. We talk about the latter reign in Seventh-day Adventist Church, the time when the Spirit is going to come. We talk about praying for that. How many of you have heard of the latter reign, that language? Sure, most of you have. It is a time anticipated in the future when God's Spirit will once again be poured out upon us as he was at Pentecost, and the world will hear the message in a way that they hadn't previously or heretofore heard it. It will be an exciting and unique time in the way we understand it, just as Pentecost of old was. All of these people from the four corners of the earth gathered, the Jewish diaspora, the the Jewish who had been banished from Palestine to the four corners of the earth, living in all these different places, and 10 points out of 10 to Peter for his pronunciation of all of those places. 
right? I mean, that, is, that was exciting. Uh, and you never know. When your pastor's sitting and somebody's reading and they come to these, wow, what are you supposed to, how are you supposed to pronounce that stuff? So, good job. We find the Jewish people coming back to Jerusalem to worship, to participate in the feasts and, and, and all of that at this time. And what do they hear? From the language they've now been raised in, from the corners of the earth, they hear Galileans, common men, uneducated common men, fishermen, speaking, and as they're speaking the gospel, what is heard is in the language of their mother tongue, not what is spoken. There's a miracle being uh, of translation happening. There's a presence of spirit like has not been felt before. For it is out of an upper room experience in which the Spirit alights on them as tongues of flame. We talked about this once once before. Um, The Spirit is present to them in a way that the Spirit hasn't been present up to that time. Recall why and why we think we need to pray for the latter rain. The upper room is a place of prayer and a place of contemplation and a place where they are seeking to allay their fears post-crucifixion. They're seeking to find an identity post-crucifixion. And they are reformulating an identity as Christ appears to them in their midst and reveals himself in his resurrected form to them. It's a time when they're beginning to think about their mission and remember the words of Jesus as he spoke to them during his time on earth. It's a time when they're adding back an apostle a disciple, one as Judas had had left their ranks. It's a time of intense prayer, and out of this, the Spirit is visited upon them, and they preach to the masses that have arrived in Jerusalem, and the church is born of Spirit. The church comes alive in this moment, and the message then as captured in Jerusalem, goes back to the four corners of the world for those who've heard the gospel, now retain the gospel and have it to share. So this amazing event is recorded for us in Acts 2. And everybody is wondering what it means. Peter identifies the meaning as found in Joel. We look for another instance of this, but Peter probably saw this as fulfilled in his day. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. What's going to happen? You're going to prophesy. Sons and daughters, young men seeing vision, old men dreaming dreams. Even on the slaves, even on the class of people that's not inher- that has no inheritance, that has no status, that has no citizenship. With regard to gender, not important. I will pour out my spirit, and they too will prophesy. This Pouring out of the Spirit transcends class, race, gender. It's a promise that God's presence will be an enlivening one at the end of time. Physical wonders will be shown in the heavens and on the earth and in the smoke and the sun turned to darkness and the moon to blood all before the great and glorious day of his coming. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is what Peter says in quoting Joel of this event. But I want you to listen to something that's happening here. Spiritually, the church is being birthed as the Holy Spirit comes upon those who believe. It's analogous to the creation of Adam. He comes alive, he's birthed, if you will, because the spirit is visited upon body. The spirit comes to flesh. And so just as we inherit life from God in the first place, just as we ourselves inherit life spiritually from the presence of God and the spirit, so the church is born of spirit and the gospel given us is born of spirit. So we get to this kind of season that that we celebrate of Fire, if you will. Fire that's deep within us. A fire of the Spirit. 
So I want to I want to talk about something that used to be a part of popular culture in the 90s. There was a fellow by the name of Sam Keen who wrote a book called A Fire in the Belly. Did any of you ever see that book or read it? You did? All right. Got a, how old are you, hon? Five? Five-year-old has read that book. We know what that means, right? A fire in the belly. We're talking about a will to live, a desire for life, an enthusiasm, a, a capacity to uh, exert energy toward something meaningful, toward goals, about a, being filled with a passion, being filled with a desire. Fire in the belly isn't anger, it's life. This fire that he's describing is a moving force. He identifies it with uh, the male gender in this particular case, but we're talking about this sense of being alive. And here's, here's what I want us to consider today. I haven't seen a season of death like I've seen in the last six months in this church. Ten and a half years I've not witnessed so many people passing. Last week I wasn't with you because my wife and I were at the funeral of a colleague of mine, 63 years old, cancer, Seventh-day Adventist preacher, gone to his rest. We're praying for Jerry Chudley, editor of The Recorder. Cancer, very ill. Will he make it? We pray. It's a season Maybe I'm just getting to that age. I think that's part of it, right? I'm getting to an age in where it, I'm not 17 and death is some sort of weird, unusual thing that happens to people with maybe a name I can attach or a face, but whom I don't know. I'm getting to that age where death is attached to people I know, people I've journeyed with, people I have a sense of experience with. And, and that is a new kind of way of experiencing life in the world we live. It's a new sense of mortality. So when we start to, to come to this place in life and think about it, what does it mean if death is for all of us and can come at any time, what is it that life is about? How is it that we really, truly come alive? I, my uh, wife's cousin, Monty, and I were talking this morning, and he said, you know, we go through seasons. He said, a few years back, it was the season of divorce. Now it's a season of people starting to pass. You remember that season of divorce, some of you? No? Your friends weren't divorcing, some of you, a few years ago? Oh, come on. What is going on there? People are hitting midlife and they're thinking about what does it mean to be fully alive? I was listening to this podcast my wife found, really interesting podcast on the, the science of desire, what, what, what our desires are about, especially in light of erotic love, and how we have different things going in our lives. We want, on the one hand, stability, home, familiarity, uh, intimacy, we want um, friendship, we want acceptance, we want all of these sorts of stable pieces, and those sometimes conflict with the other things that we want, those things that have to do with desire and our erotic life, our, our, our thoughts on those things. And so how do we bring all that together? Well, we see that some families don't make it through that. There's seasons of divorce. And then we get to life itself and people passing, and we think, what is the meaning of all of this? How is it that we're to live, and, and what does that mean? Well, fire in the belly is, is one answer to that, passionately, in tune with what it is that, who it is that we are and what it is that we're to be about. But the spiritual answer is we come to life by the grace of God in the first place. Life is a gift. We live it in the presence of spirit. We're enlivened by God's spirit. And ultimately, the church is born of God's spirit. We anticipate what God can do in the future, and we declare 
we declare what God is doing in the present through that same spirit. The last passage where I want to spend the most time this morning is the dry bones. Some of you may be a fan of zombie films. I am not. But that whole genre just sounds kind of familiar as you look at this passage, right? You've got this scattering of bones. Think of the imagery here. You've got sort of a desert scape with a scattering of dry bones. And all of a sudden, clicking noises start happening because these bones are automatically starting to assemble themselves into skeletons. Now, right about now in the movie, you're sitting like this, right? Shoulders hunched, uh, fists clenched a little bit. You're maybe reaching for somebody next to you. And then it gets stranger. The bones aren't only clicking together. They're becoming upright and beginning to move. And they're beginning to be fleshed out. Sinew and tendon are attached and muscle and organ. And you're beginning to see, well, one of these science life exhibits coming right there, you know, before you. The musculature and all that being obvious. And then finally coated with skin. And still there's no life the bones have put on flesh, and the flesh has put on skin, and the human form is now complete, and there's still no life. But what a miracle, and what a strange sight, this desolate place. Pretty good zombie film, huh? But it doesn't end like that. Prophesy to these bones. Say to them, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know I am the Lord. We talk about being dead in our sins and alive in Christ. We talk about being lost and found as we did in our lesson study this morning. If we've been dead and, and have been brought to life, maybe this is the analogy. God has prophesied, I will put flesh on those bones and breathe into you and you will come to life. So the prophecy was made. Ezekiel spoke the words, or the Son of Man spoke the words, but there was no breath in the people that were made. Then he said, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, Son of Man, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, come breath, breathe into these slain that they may live. So I did what I was told, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. How strange and wonderful. And then he said, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We're cut off. But this is what God says. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will know. You will know that I am the Lord when I opened your graves and brought you up, bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. What does it mean to live? It means that out of our desolation, out of our mortality, out of our loss, out of our separation from one another, from our environment, from our God. Out of our desolation, God can put flesh upon these bones and breathe life into them and give them a place and an inheritance. What was so important for the people of Israel was that they be reestablished in their land, that they live in peace and be established in their land, that they enjoyed the honey and the milk, and the fruits, and the vegetables, and the wines, and the grains, that they could live in their villages in peace, and that the earth would produce its harvests, that the sun would shine, the crops would grow, 
and all would be well with the world. There's an, there's an eschatological aspect of this, too. There's a looking forward piece, too, that the desolation ends and we inherit life in a world made new. With all the loss that I've experienced and all the loss that's going on that we've collectively experienced, I don't want to focus on life to come. We believe in the resurrection and the life. But I want to focus on what it means to live now. What it means to live now. Life now for the Christian is defined simply as this, that you allow the Spirit of God to breathe life into your dry bones. You see, metaphorically, the living can be the living dead. Just because you're alive doesn't mean that you are alive. Just because you have physical life doesn't mean you have spiritual life. Just because you have physical life doesn't mean that your soul is thriving. Just because you have physical life doesn't mean that you're happy or engaged or that you're loving people. It doesn't mean that you're experiencing the full range of human experience and emotion. It means that you're just alive. Living can sometimes be existence, not life. So many people on this planet are existing. They're the living dead or the living severely wounded and limited, the living shut down, the living hurt. They're not really zombies, but that's the metaphor. They're alive, but not alive. Jesus said it simply. I've come that you might live. Really live. I've freed you to live that you might live life and live it abundantly. I've not just freed you, but I've empowered you. I've given you life in the first place, and I've given you life by the Spirit that I've sent. And I've prophesied not horrible things for you, but wonderful things for you, that your dry bones might be enfleshed and that my breath might enliven them and that you might really, truly live. I don't know how many days, hours, weeks, months, years, decades of life I have. None of us do. There would be something disappointing about knowing that, wouldn't it? For some of you, would like, really, I have to trudge on to 105? I don't know how I'm going to do that. And some of you are going to go, you've got to be kidding me. Day after tomorrow? I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I don't want to be like a, an existentialist or anything, but I do want to say, in the spirit, we need to live every day to the fullest. In the spirit, we need to embrace the life that's been given us. In the spirit, we need to take on the tasks that God gives us to take, for therein will lie our fulfillment. In the spirit, we need to love as he loves. In the Spirit, we need to celebrate all of the goodness that's in our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't find very many times when he was, how do I put it, fasting, when he was withdrawn. There are times and seasons where he goes into silence and he goes off to pray. We see that in Scripture. But when he's engaged with humanity, he's present to them fully seeking to heal, to instill hope, to set them free from the bounds of religion as well as set them free in the graces of religion. He's speaking into their lives as they live them every day. Dry bones come to life. Prophesy. Speak hope. Live fully. <coughs> Feast on the goodness of the land. Know that I am God and that I have the power of life. And don't fear, for breath departed can be restored. Don't fear, because I am with you even to the end of the age. 
don't fear because these bones, they shall live again and inherit the land that God gives them. I hope, I hope that what I've said means something to you today. Because as we look at the fire of Pentecost, it isn't about a future event called the latter rain that we look forward to as Adventists. It isn't just about the mission of the church. As we look at Pentecost, it isn't some odd sort of thing where hair is on fire and not on fire. When we look at Pentecost, it isn't about a communist group of people in an upper room sharing everything and talking about stuff that's happened. When we look at Pentecost, we're talking about enlivening spirit, renewed mission, focus, joy, purpose, celebration, life. Find that fire in your belly and may it be the spirit of God sent to us from Jesus Christ. Amen.